Hey everyone, Chris Collier here, the social media icon, the host of Pod Conquer with Chris, the podcast you don't want to miss. Listen, <clears throat> I'm doing this video for a couple of different reasons. Um, <clears throat> this is a raw, uncut, unedited video. I'm going to tell you my life story thus far. I'm to about 50 and a half, okay? So, I was born in the year 1972. Um... <clears throat> to my parents, Gary and Terry Collier, in um, Butterworth Hospital in Kent County, Michigan. Okay. Uh, had a happy family, happy home. <coughs> Excuse me. From what I can remember. Um, lived in a trailer park. So we started off, my parents owned a trailer in a trailer park. And um, we had... Um, in the center of the trailer park there was a swimming pool it was covered indoor we'd go there and swim all the time that became one of my favorite things as a kid swimming and uh, sport would always be a part of my life up until my mid uh, uh, late 30s early 40s I was a huge sports uh, person sportsman not in the sense of an outdoor sportsman but like a sportsman playing games uh, like basketball, football, baseball, swimming, etc. Um, so, within the small trailer park, and we lived there, and my next door neighbors were German. We we called them Ompa and Oma. They were, uh, that was German for grandpa and grandma. And uh, they weren't my grandparents, but we adopted them. And I grew up in a very Christian family, very loving family. Uh, my dad was a hard-working man. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Then shortly thereafter, my brother, my mom got pregnant with my brother, and I remember I had to be like two or three. I was trying to help my mom best I could. I was a little bit young to be helping her. But I remember one time, uh, right after my brother was born, I had to be about three. I was doing dishes, and my dad came in for work. And he said, oh, you're helping mom do the dishes. And so that has always been a goal and a, a heart tug, if you will, of mine, is being able to help people, right? It's being able to help, be a help, be of service to somebody. Um, so then um, I started going to school. I went to uh, Grand Rapids Christian Academy and uh, I remember going there and then shortly uh, a couple years after that, um, we moved from Cutlerville to um, Grand Rapids. We had a house, and um, I remember the house. It was not much to talk about. I don't even remember the rooms or anything. But I just remember the house had a front porch. Uh, screen in front porch and sometimes they had glass on the front porch and um, we stayed there my next door neighbors again next door neighbors and this you'll see a theme playing out in my life a multicultural multi-dimensional <clears throat> another part of my life my next door neighbors were Hispanic Eddie and um, I can't remember his brother's name Eddie Gonzalez that was the next door neighbors and I grew up next to them, and they, we became friends. We were on uh, a baseball team together, and uh, it was uh, it was t-ball, I think I, I remember correctly, and it was a lot of fun, right? So uh, once again, sports, right? Uh, I started going to a program called AWANA. It stands for Approved Workmen Needeth Not to Be Ashamed. Uh, it's a Christian version of like. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, but more focused on scripture than anything, you know, tying knots and stuff really doesn't play a huge deal to them. But it's just more scripture memorization, becoming more like Christ, things of that nature. Um, didn't do too well in that. Uh, don't know if I didn't apply myself. I just don't know if my mind could comprehend what I was trying to do. Um, thinking back on it now, don't remember a whole lot about the verses and stuff from that part 
of the Iwana program. I might have been trying to do too much. Uh, but I remember the games and stuff we played. A lot of fun. Uh, then we... I think my mom got pregnant again, and we moved again. This time, we moved to a little town called Middleville. Middleville, to this day, is still what I consider my hometown. It's where my heart uh, was, and still kind of is. Uh, I was, I got my, um, my sister was born. I went to a satellite school of uh, Grand Rapids Christian Academy, but at Middleville. I think they called it Middleville Christian Academy. Went there for a couple years, and then after they disbanded that, decided not to do that, my parents homeschooled me. About that time, my mom got pregnant with her fourth child, my sister Andrea. So you have Kurt, my brother, April, my oldest sister, which she's younger than me, but she's the oldest one I have, and my youngest sister, Andrea. All, there was six of us. And I want to say almost every year we take a vacation and typically go to um, the Upper Peninsula, which is so beautiful. I don't know what it's like now, but back when I was growing up, it was so beautiful. And let me say this, just so I can say this. The time I grew up had to be the best time to grow up because electronics were being introduced. They weren't so oppressive like they are now. Like a kid knows how to do a cell phone before they know how to talk almost now, right? Um, we still played outside. We still could ride our bikes down the street and go to neighbors' houses without hardly any problems. Every once in a while you run into a problem, but you know, uh, child abduction was a at a low still it was becoming more prevalent but we played outside and we had fun we had friends and um, I went to Christian camps when I uh, got a little bit older and uh, about this time about I'd say uh, before my sister Andrew came I was nine so let's see I was three when she had Kurt I was six when she had so yeah I was about nine when she had April or Andrea my mom had Andrea so I was a paper boy and being a paper boy is huge to me it gave me my entrepreneurial spirit right even though I wasn't technically an entrepreneur I didn't create or make something myself I was turn around selling newspapers and making a profit and uh, I had I had started delivering newspapers and during this time my parents decided to start homeschooling us which gave me an advantage over all the other paper guys out there paper boys out there paper girls uh, I could start early so <clears throat> long story short is I started I had a paper out started a real small one worked real hard then another paper boy quit so I picked up his route I had two routes then another paper boy quit so then I picked up three routes, and I did three routes for a while, and I decided three routes was a little bit much, because I had half the city. Our city only had about 3,000 people in it, if, I think, if we were lucky. And um, I'd ride my bike around. And let me tell you something. It's funny, now that I'm 50 plus, uh, I used to ha have like $200 on me sometimes during the week uh, as a paper boy. And there are times now that I don't have that much in my bank account it's just funny right um, but that's gonna change because you haven't heard the end of the story so <clears throat> growing up in Michigan Christian household Christian groups um, that we had a, uh, a co-op Christian um, homeschool party I guess that's what we call it and homeschool gathering a couple a couple times a month once every other week and we'd have a chorus and we'd have different things we do together and I made a lot of friends oh man and um, so I also played uh, let me go back I have to go back a little bit I played soccer for a while I played soccer for two or three years I was midfield midfield center center midf midfielder and I scored nine of our 16 goals one year. We were undefeated, uh, except for the championship game. We lost that one. So I want to say we were like uh, 16 and one, something of that nature. Um, 
you know, I just remember having times with God that were very important, very sustainable. I also have to go back when we're still in the trailer park in Grand Rapids in, in Cutlerville. Uh, I have to go back and say that I remember one night we came home from church and I was just overwhelmed by the Spirit of God and I started crying. My dad said, what are you crying about, Chris? And I was like, Dad, I don't know. I just, I don't know what's right. I just feel like I'm evil. I feel like I'm a horrible person. The best that way to communicate as a, a three and a half year old or four year old to my dad and um, he said, well, you know, you've got to, um, he led me in the steps of repentance and accepting Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. So through my childhood, I always had a great, great relationship with Jesus. Um, yeah, great relationship with Jesus. And um, loved reading my Bible, loved singing songs to the Lord. And um, I loved going to VBS. And uh, as a matter of fact is, I remember one year uh, they had a Bible drill competition. And I think they had it two or three different churches and I won all three of them, uh, the different churches in town. So that was kind of funny. And um, like I said, I played soccer for a few years. Uh, earlier on, I played t-ball. Um, and then I played football, liked football, didn't really get to play a whole much, but liked it. Almost had an interception one time, I played uh, right guard defense. Uh, wasn't a big guy then, like I am now, but always was kind of husky. So, um, grew up till about age 13, 14, I want to say the summer before my 14th birthday, I had about, I would say 10 or 11 guys that came over to my house and we all had a, a sleepover and celebrated my birthday because we did it in August sometimes because it was hard to get everyone together during the fall once everyone got back to school. So um, it might have been fall, I don't remember when it was, but I had paid for by my paper out a shed on stilts it cost me about seven hundred eight hundred dollars and I had this clubhouse that I called it and we all we got all ten of us fit in there once we put the 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 bottom door on it was very easy for us to get everyone in there and so we um, got everyone in there we slept and uh, had a great time the next day we played pickup football had a blast pit playing pickup football and um, long story short um, <clears throat> that was a lot of fun the next summer comes around you know homeschooling everything comes along uh, we move from Michigan my dad oh my dad gets a settlement from his job where he got hurt and uh, he, he thinks it's the best idea that we all move to North Carolina. Looking back on it, there are a lot of things that I think, in looking back at my life, there's a few, only a few things I would have done differently. This is not one of them. I'm glad my parents moved to North Carolina. I'll get to that story later on. But to know that my parents made a decision, because they thought about us kids, they thought about everything, and they said, let's go to North Carolina. Don't know why they chose North Carolina out of all the 50 states, but God had a reason. And I think part of that reason was me. I don't know more about other brothers and sisters, but how God's done in their life. But I can tell you, my life has it forever been changed. Think about 14. You've grown up all in the Midwest, Michigan. Uh, you grew up mainly around white folk. And uh, except for the two iterations where... You know, I had Hispanic and German influence on my life. So, moving down to North Carolina, culture shock. It took me, culture, social, total shocks. It, it bothered me for a long time. And 
and I don't mean bother me like in my mind, bother me in my heart, and I didn't know how to, in, I didn't know how to interact with people from the south. Just didn't, didn't know how to, what their, what their angle is. Where I come from, you just are who you are, and you do what you do. Everyone had a motive, and all this stuff wasn't used to that. So, um, we moved to North Carolina. Parents um, went to a Christian high school. Back in back in a school setting, I had to adjust to that. A little bit socially awkward. And let me go back before we moved. Um, every year we had to take a test, some kind of sub a standardized test, so they knew we were doing well in our studies. It wasn't just so, oh yeah, we're just passing them, and you know, the state wanted just some proof that we were learning something or doing something. So in that ninth grade, I was testing ninth grade. I really was uh, seventh or eighth grade. I uh, tested me ninth grade, and. Uh, I tested first year of college. A couple good things with homeschooling versus public education or even private education. It's typically you, you do better. I would say I was a little bit socially awkward, but I had my 10, 15 friends, remember, that came over for my birthday. Uh, but here's the problem. When I moved to North Carolina, those friends didn't come with me. So now I became socially awkward. All those friendships, all those relationships I had all those connections I had, I didn't have them anymore. They're all gone. I was gone. I was outside the state. I had a different, I didn't have anybody but my family. I didn't have anybody but God and my family. I know some of you say, oh, you just hold on to God. But you're a teenager, um, early teen, 14, and you've left everything you know behind. This is all new. It was exciting. It was fun. But there was also some Hmm. Didn't, and this is before the internet this is before cell phones this is before any of that now I have to try to keep track of my friends via phone long distance where it still costs you money to call long distance so I lost track of all my friends all of them and uh, so I went to a, a private Christian school and uh, played basketball soccer again and baseball and I did really well at baseball let me um, you know it's socially awkward uh, my baseball batting average was insane I, I can't quote it for you but I want to say it was towards the 600s because I could always place the ball where they weren't and I played shortstop I got the job when um, the coach the the senior high was away on a field trip I remember in ninth grade so I don't get to go on this senior high. Uh, I was still considered junior high. Uh, 10th and 11th grade and 12th grade got to go on that trip. And so while they're away on that trip, I'm playing, uh, just fielding balls for the coach. And um, he has a couple kids running base and he has a line drive to me. And um, the guy snag it and there was two guys on base one on first one on second the guy from second goes off the base I tag him and fake it and the guy goes off first like they can steal second but I had thrown it and then he goes back to first and the guy tags him out at first so he, he said that was, that was an intelligent play Chris I'm gonna keep you at shortstop and so when all the seniors and stuff got back the juniors and the sophomores they were mad because a freshman got shortstop right so um, I I did real well in baseball and I probably could have pursued that and to my regret I probably could have played all at several different levels but needless to say God has purpose in everything you do and everything you don't do so um, that year ended I uh, then transferred to another private Christian school it was more like homeschool in the sense like you go as fast or slow as you want <clears throat> But um, it you did around other people. So long, so that was uh, College Lakes Christian Academy. The first one was Cornerstone Christian Academy in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, College Lakes Christian Academy. I uh, played uh, flag football. 
not a big fan of flag football. Too many rules that don't make sense, and uh, the way the refs refed it, kind of unfair. I played uh, basketball, and I think that was it, but so, uh, flag football and baseball, uh, basketball. And then um, from there, I went to Southview Senior High in Hope Mills, North Carolina. Um, we just had a place in our life where parents felt like they couldn't afford to keep putting me through school like that. So I went to uh, public school and I want to play sports anyway. I, I, I've always been an athlete, uh, still want to be an athlete. I'm attempting to get back in shape. So uh, about this time, I'd say uh, about when I'm 13, I catch a Saturday Night Superstars. So I'm going back to Michigan real quick. Remember something, I catch Saturday Night Superstars. I'm watching Hulk Hogan, the Macho Man Randy Savage. I said, why do they get all the cool names like that, right? This is before the guys like they have now. They don't have people who have names like that now, typically. Um, sometimes they do. Roman Reigns has a good, catchy name like that. So I said, my name's Chris Collier. That's kind of catchy, but I need something else to it. So I dubbed myself The Conqueror, Chris The Conqueror Collier. Ever since then till now, I am, have been The Conqueror. Um, so uh, we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Uh, so all that happened. Now I'm in I'm in a real public high school. I am a sophomore. I'm a little bit well adjusted, a little more adjusted. Um, first year, I want to say uh, my classes were U.S. History. They made me retake that because the name that was on the U.S. History I took before was not the correct name for how they called it now. So I had to retake it, no problem. I aced that, plus got all the bonus points. So my grade point average in that was like 1.1, right? <laughs> so um, I took that, I took geometry, I took, no, yeah, geometry, I took uh, auto tech and principal technology and gym, because I had to have a gym, because they said I didn't have enough PE. Go figure. Long story short, <coughs> uh, didn't do anything the first, my sophomore, uh, my junior year, I'm sorry, it's my junior year of high school. Junior year of high school, I'm in public school. And I um, don't do anything that year. And um, I start meeting these people. I start making a couple good friends here and there. I become part of the Latin club. Yeah, nerdy, but I, I liked it. Uh, and the chess club. We did those things, and then I was a part of uh, TSA, Technology Students of America, and uh, there was some kind of mechanical, uh, so for the Auto Tech, Auto Association of America, or something like that, for the students. And uh, that club kind of fell in disrepair after the first uh, six months or so. And, uh, but I was a firm, uh, a firm believer in TSA. And then, um, next year I made some friends. We started hanging out. One of them was Mike Diaz and he was a, uh, cross country runner. He said, you should come out here and run with us. I'm like, okay, I don't know. Yeah, I can run a little bit. I ran with him a little bit, but these boys could run. Can I tell you these boys, like they run 10 miles in. 32 minutes, 30, 35 minutes, 36 minutes, something like that, something crazy. And I'm out there running. I get down about 45, not not too terribly bad. And maybe I got the time drawn, but man, they were flying. And I knew I was way behind them. But I started getting better and better and better. So lo and behold, I end up joining the cross country team that that late summer, early fall. And I'm running cross country. I'm working about 40 hours a week at uh, Roses. Roses. For those of you who don't know what Roses is. It was like a place kind of like Walmart before Walmart was Walmart. Except they didn't have food. They just sold clothing and jewelry and automotive and toys, right? <clears throat> Long story short. Go through the school year. My grade point average is a 3.85 my senior year. I get some uh, academics stuff. I get invited to several different places. But I get a cross-country scholarship for Fayetteville State University. Shout out to my Broncos out there. Um, 
So I ran cross country for them for a year and went to school there for a year and about a half. And I just couldn't do it. It wasn't for me. I don't know how else to say it. Several things happened. I will say this is one of my um, memories of Fail State, I had a lot of great memories. Different people interacting with, you know, different uh, people from different backgrounds. But one of my worst memories was I had a professor that um, discriminated against me. And he said, well, you went to HBCU. I said, yeah, I did. And he, he was my English professor, and I asked him for help. And he said his hours were from 11 to 2 on these days. I knocked on his door, and he had a note there, knock, and I'll answer. And um, I knocked. He we didn't answer. I knocked again. He didn't answer. I tried to open the door. It was locked. So then when, you know, I waited for the, the time that he told me, and then I waited longer. Because if you tell me you're going to do something, I believe you're going to do it. And he got he got to be about quarter to two, and he's getting ready to leave. I see him open the door. He, he's wheelchair bound. And he, he said, uh, he came out, and I said, hey, how's it going, professor? I don't even remember his name now. And he says to me, you should have been here earlier. I said, I've been here for an hour and a half. He said, well, I don't have any time for you. And proceeded down. And I ended up failing his class. It was a pass or fail. And it just showed me the sadness. What, what makes me sad is someone, if anyone knows me, they know uh, that's I would never tolerate something like that being done to someone else. But this guy saw fit to put me through the ringer. Uh, he, he had his ways about him. I don't know what his problem was. Don't care. I'm not mad at him. But I, I share that to kind of see kind of the path I went down. Um, had to go through. Just some of the things. Uh, I left Fayetteville State. And I'd say uh, started working. Uh, when I went, was at Fayetteville State, I didn't work a job. Uh, but shortly thereafter, I started working at a place called Pizza Inn. I loved Pizza Inn's concept. Great concept. Uh, buffet three nights a week. All you can eat. We were near a military base. I'm sure they loved it too. It was a great, great experience. But then um, I met some friends. And we I got introduced to network marketing. It's always been near and dear to my heart. Not quite as much as, as anything else in my life. Like sports and my love for Jesus uh, quite a bit I love Jesus with everything I got um, still had a great relationship with Jesus still living the life living for the Lord um, and then I moved to then I moved personally just by myself moved to Raleigh North Carolina stay up there a while get a girlfriend she invites me to this church in Ammon, North Carolina, which is south of Fayetteville, back by Whiteville. And uh, it's just a family church. It's all her aunts and uncles are there. And uh, long story short, that was a great experience. She had to be Af African American. And going back and forth, learning how, look, seeing church in a different light seeing how they did things taught me so much and in Raleigh I had a job as a CPA certified pool attendant and I liked it it was fun uh, I typically did uh, Monday through Friday 8 to 5 every once in a while I'd do a weekend for part of the day I just had to make sure the pools were clean and they're full of chemicals uh, or the chemical you know the chemical uh, was right in the pool so I had that job for a year year and a half two years and someone introduced me to the manager trainee program at McDonald's trained to be a manager with them I was doing both bam 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 and I, I was making good money but I didn't have a mind to go into business so I just live in life nights I was off from it I only worked part-time at McDonald's so I was off at McDonald's I go out I go play ball I go to the movies I mean when I tell you like I've done some stuff man we we used to go and I have a friend who tells me I was the king of Raleigh North Carolina uh, I could walk into a movie theater people give me passes I walk into restaurants people give me food like 
it's just the way it was. I was really well known in Raleigh back during those times. And uh, I met two of my lifelong friends. Uh, shout out to Dexter Lobo Williams. Uh, Dexter was one of my best friends in the world. And Carrington Atkins. I met him in, in Raleigh as well. About both the same time. All those friends I lost in from Michigan. Oh, by the way, I forgot this part of my story. And maybe I'll edit it and put it in where it belongs. But one day I was working at Rose's. My dad pulls up and says uh, for me to come. Uh, he calls the store. Tells me I need to come home. I get in the car and come home. And my dad says, Chris, some of your friends were in a car accident. So that's horrible. Are they okay? He said, no, all of them are dead but one. I was like, oh, gosh. What happened? They said they were killed by a drunk driver. I was like, that's horrible. So four of my best friends were in a car and got killed by a drunk driver. One of them uh, lived on, but he was a vegetable, unfortunately. And he, he it was like he wasn't really alive. And... Um, I told you, wait till further on the story, and I'll tell you why it was important that we move from North Carolina. This protected my life. I wasn't with them. It, it, as much as it hurts me to know that they're gone, and, and I never will see them on this side of heaven, to know that God protected me and moved me from North Carolina, uh, from Michigan to North Carolina, is huge. So... During this time in Fayetteville, I kind of back, I backslide. I'm not quite close to the Lord. I help a couple people plant churches. Then I, I meet Carrington again. He's on fire for Jesus. And I go to church with him. And for 10 weeks, I go to church with him. And Raleigh International Church, shout out to then, then pastor, now Bishop Garland Hunt, and all the people at RIC, Raleigh International Church, Pastor Olden Thornton's now the pastor there, and what a great place, the Spirit of God was moving there, um, great people, just seeking after God, with reckless abandon. So for 10 weeks, I attended regularly. I, I brought my tithes and offerings there. I did whatever I felt God wanted me to there. And then Carrington says, Chris, I'm getting ready to leave for Nashville. Can you help me pack? And will you help me move my family to Nashville? I said, I'll be glad to help you. It's my pleasure. That's what we do. We help each other. We're friends. And so I helped him move his family to Nashville. Something clicked in my head. I said, it's time to move. During this time, I left one job and was taking a job at another job. So I had a perfect gap, an opportunity to move into another job. That's one. Two, my girlfriend and I broke up. And she had a tendency to try to get back into my life. I was not having it anymore. I didn't want, I, I rededicated my life to the Lord. I was going hard for him. So I fit really well in this group at Nashville, but something was missing for me in the Nashville plan. I couldn't put my finger on it. Several times I even tried to leave Nashville and <clears throat> look for ways to get out, but it didn't work. It didn't happen. So. three, three and a half, four years into it, uh, my friend Carrington, want to help move, he decides it's time for him and his family to move to Atlanta and help Bishop Boone reestablish the church here. And it's announced shortly about, I would say half a year later, that the church that we have, High Walk, all the High Walks out there, let me hear you. Uh, let me, let me talk more about Nashville a little bit. I, I'm, I'm breezing by some stuff here. Uh, those of those guys are at 1007 Watt Circle. Let me tell you. Um, 
a lot of great things happen there I'll tell you um, if you ever see me in person you can ask me about the deliverance story okay I'll tell you but I can't do it on here I can't do it justice because it, it just it is what it is but we had a total of I want to say six guys maybe seven stay with us at 1007 watt circle and they filtered in and filtered out one of them got married another one got married and then we had some other guys come in so long story short I keep saying long story short <laughs> so they taught me about being a brother it taught me about different things and I gotta tell you I didn't learn my lessons that I should have learned uh, there were some things I could learn about finances there's some things I could have learned about being a better help to your brother to your sister and at the end of the day I was I just partitioned off my mind somehow things I got to do and one of the things is you'll never accuse me of not working you'll never accuse me of not trying to provide so I knew what the the note on the apartment was we just kept going and going and going everything you know went from one brother to another brother to another brother and soon it was in my hands and then when it all faded they wanted to stay in my name I said go ahead keep it up just make sure you do everything I leave it with y'all so I move um, end up I'm while I'm there and after the church thing I helped plant two other churches while I'm there help with two other church plants and then I move to Atlanta home of uh, the father's house and FOIC Fellowship International Churches Bishop Wellington Boone and uh, now Bishop Garland Hunt's there Pastor Collier's there Pastor Reed's there Pastor Lamb's there we got all these pastors Elder Roach have all these people and it's great it's impactful it's moving it's wonderful we don't even have a building yet and I'm looking around like God's gonna do something wonderful with this and I'm biding my time I'm waiting on God I'm waiting on God one of the things I've learned is when you wait on God God's gonna do something so uh, when I moved to Atlanta I didn't have a job right away shortly thereafter I get an interview with Pizza Hut uh, for a general manager position I take it it was like 45 grand and I did real well with Pizza Hut now I'm I'm glad I was with them for the three years I was with them about the time um, Hmm. About the time uh, they um, moved around Atlanta, <clears throat> uh, first six months or so, I stay with uh, Carrington Carmelo. Uh, they have let me stay with their son, uh, and uh, they had a two bedroom. They shared graciously with me. They were they were most gracious. I probably frustrated the grace more than I help the grace for myself um, then I stayed out in Lawrenceville with a, another couple then I moved from Lawrenceville to Ackworth and then I bought my own place um, I had someone deceive me they told me there's $3,500 $3, worth of improvements that you need to make to the property as soon as I got the house, I found out there's thirty-five thousand dollars. The person who was helping me, the real estate agent who was helping me, who didn't help me, um, told I asked, I told him let's let's we should get a, a inspection done, right? No need for an inspection. No need for an inspection. If I would have found out it was in the pro way it was, I wouldn't have bought it. So long story short, I ended up losing that house during the two thousand eight crash uh, because just different things happen right um, it's funny when you have good times everyone wants to clap pat you on the back and give you high fives when you're down times you know uh, one time they asked this guy why do you kick a man when he's down and he said well he's closer to my foot it makes more sense and so when you're going through down times just remember that that person will be exalted at some point they're gonna have a time to go up and so I didn't worry about how people were treating me, how people abandoned me uh, in my time of need. And so um, 
moved in with an, a, a brother from the church and uh, everything was good I, w I worked at this point I lost my job at Pizza because I went away for vacation and they changed the way they weighed their oil their oil would weigh first they did it in gallons then you change it liters then you change it to um, something else so may I have it backwards but I entered it as one and it was the other it showed more than what we really had right hopefully you can track with that so that let me go because of that so I moved on I did some newspaper I did newspaper delivery again I was delivering newspapers to Kroger and Publix and different gas stations quick trips and um, then I interviewed with Waffle House Waffle House has been the stablest position I've had for my whole life I've been working off and on with Waffle House for 18 years now as the day of this recording I've been a manager I've been a cook so these are some of the things I've done with Waffle House and I'm still with them to this day so I was staying with that brother I was working at Waffle House I'll make sure yeah I'm working at Waffle House now and it just seems like so many things changed like a lot of my friends from the church they're all they all left the church and I was coming by from time to time but I wasn't really regular because when you work at Waffle House you work six days and off too and a lot of times I take those days to go see my parents or something and every once in a while I get a weekend off and I go see go to church but oh, it's good to see you good to be here and um, so I live with one of the brothers from the church and we had a great apartment then we move out towards um, what's that area called out north of Buford and uh, that was a great place to stay and uh, you know what I got it backwards we stayed out north in Buford and then moved to an apartment in Duluth that apartment was great love the apartment there and then after that the guy says I don't want to renew it because I told I said I didn't want my name on a lease by myself anymore unless you guys are willing to pitch in because I really feel the pressure I said I've been on time but his brother was always slack right so ended up having to move somewhere else and um, this family had a room with a um, what's it called a restroom in it and that's what I had that was my place I had got to stay um, so I stayed there a while and then they all of a sudden decide they were gonna move had to move out got me an apartment and when I got my apartment I uh, still Waffle House through this whole time I struggled let, let me let me explain something as a man I didn't know my way financially and still to this day I'm figuring some of this stuff out see I know this can be kind of controversial but when a woman comes of age she's already been practicing with dolls and she has most women have a maternity instinct not all but most and being a woman comes naturally being a man every man knows this every man knows this that you don't know what you're supposed to be other than a provider that comes naturally to me as the air I breathe I'm supposed to go work and make money making a home making a uh, protecting that's part of my nature too so my struggle was not providing but not being a derelict when it came to spending money I would spend money and be like oh I forgot to pay a bill and just escape my mind and I'd be homeless I end up not paying my rent and getting evicted or I end up just um, 
So I've learned lessons through the hard knocks I've had to take. Unfortunately, I've had to take a lot. My hair's thinning out. <laughs> so through all that, um, I moved a couple more times. And then um, I met a young lady at work. And it was... Um, we didn't like each other at first. Actually, we despised each other. I couldn't stand the fact she was always late for everything for no reason. And sometimes it was a good reason, but a lot of times I'm like, you got to plan ahead for these things. You can't just all of a sudden just show up when you want. It's a long story short. I fire her from the job. She worked with me. We end up talking and talking and talking and talking, and I'm getting married. We're still married to this day. My wife's name's Angela. Greatest, second greatest decision, decision I ever made. First was accepting Jesus, my personal Lord and Savior. Second was marrying her. Because she has been a foundation, uh, and a stone I can rely on. We've lost her parents. We've lost one of my parents. It's been very hard these 11 years. We've been through some things that I told you about them. Some of the things I can't tell because um, just family issues that people have, right? And if I told them, someone's going to be offended. So I'm not going to tell them. During this time, though, we help plan. Me, myself, I've helped plan 15 to 20 churches in the Atlanta metro area and before, right? In Nashville and in Raleigh. So I've helped plant churches. So this is kind of just who I am and what I do. And so we got married. I was 39. And we've been married 12 years now. I took three years off of Waffle House. Excuse me. Moved to Mississippi. I did smart hands, IT work. Loved doing it. And uh, paid pretty well. Except I had to pay for my own hotel and own food. So it got kind of expensive. And gas. I love the job. It just got really expensive. And so then uh, her mom passed. And uh, some things happened in my life where I, I felt like I had to shoot back to Atlanta. Help get our foundation back here. It didn't work like I wanted. Then her dad passed. So I went down with the funeral for that and then came back up here, tried harder, um, got back on at Waffle House. Things weren't working the way I wanted them to. Oh, I forgot about this too. Uh, right after her, I can't remember when it happened, but one early year, uh, a company called us and said, we'd like you to become part of our team. Yeah, it's great. They flew us all the way out to Utah, Salt Lake City, MLM headquarters. That's where all the MLM places are. All the network marketing companies are, except for a few, right? Um, we got to see the facility. We got to see some of this, some of that. Long story short is they want us to become part of their team. We considered it. We were going to help them, but we wanted some help in return. And they couldn't help us so that company fell apart and we didn't work with them um, and over the years I've accumulated a handful of friends here and there um, Doc Reed pastor Doc Reed still a friend I mentioned him earlier Carrington Adkins Dexter Williams still friends um, there's so many people, I don't want to start naming too many names. But those are my close friends. Uh, I also met a gentleman out of West Virginia, his name is Bishop Sam Calloway. Great friend and mentor. Um, which we go up there every year. Let me tell you a story about this man has been in West Virginia. You talk about racism. African American gentleman married to a white woman. They're pastoring a church in Oak Hill, West Virginia. And that he gives it to you straight. He gives it to you raw. He's not going to sugar, sugar coat it for you. He's going to give it to you real. And I love him for that. Faithful, growing ministry in Oak Hill, West Virginia. 
So uh, he's been a part of my life for well, uh, 11 years now. 11 years we've been going to Oak Hill, except for maybe two. One was uh, Corona. Me two were Corona. But at any rate, awesome man of God. And I want to also say Bishop Boone has been a huge influence in my life. I can't state that enough. Guided me, uh, oversight. Bishop Hunt, honorable mention. I don't see him much anymore, but that's more my fault than his. Uh, I want to say something about that. There's nothing wrong with losing track of people. Some people are meant for seasons and some for reasons. Bishop Hunt helped me transition twice. Once from Raleigh to Nashville, then Nashville to Atlanta. Um, all the people that I've interacted with. Listen, if I've ever hurt or offended you, that was not, that's not my nature. I want the best for you. I really do. I, I want the very best for you because you are called to who you're called to be and to reach the people you're called to be and sometimes the bible says man sharpens iron man as iron sharpens iron give your thought that that iron rubbing against the other piece of iron if they could talk what they would say they'd be like get that other piece of iron off of me i don't want that uh you hurt me every time you come around here you irritate me you know the bible says no weapon formed against you shall prosper didn't say it wouldn't hurt. Didn't say it wouldn't knock stuff off that's not necessary. But back to my point, if I did anything to hurt you, that's not my intention or what I wanted from my life. I try to live my life towards Jesus. I try to live my life waiting for not only his second coming, but waiting for him to visit us in worship. We're, we're, we started a group back in November of this past year we're just waiting and worshiping on God. It's not about anything but getting His presence. Not about anything but getting in His glory. Not about anything but Him. See, we've made the church way too complicated. So, over the course of the next few years, you'll be hearing more and more from me, and we'll be adding more and more to my story about how we, and there's some things I haven't told you, I've skipped right along and as they come to me I'll add them to this so as we go along in life and as we grow in ministry because this is this mainly intro to my ministry intro to what I'm gonna do as a ministry Carking Kingdom International Ministries is a ministry God's called my wife and I to helping men and women recapture a passion for King Jesus we want you to join us now if you're interested I'm putting this up on my Conquer with Chris the podcast you don't want to miss you can reach out to us through um, my Facebook profile Minister Chris C or Minister C Collier or something like that uh, my Facebook profile and I'll put that in the description you can come find me there and interact send me a DM and let me know you're interested in ministry because that's where we're headed I have a God's given me a plan to move forward so talk about the past let's talk about moving forward what do I see in the future I see my podcast growing and growing and growing but I also see a ministry growing and growing and growing how are we gonna do this one we're gonna get ourselves a location where we can have a, a flex location we can have a store we can have a studio, we can have uh, a meeting area, and we can have uh, offices and mailboxes. The, that whole plan I'll lay out for you another time. The vision and going forward is to help others reach their destiny in God. While I might not be your pastor, I might not be your uh, overseer, I might not be the one that's called to lead you but maybe I can help guide you to the place where you're leading others because my goal is to help others lead others I have no I, I don't have any desire to be a pastor in the sense of having a church pastor I desire to help others be pastoring others so 
whether you call that bishop or apostle, I, I don't care what you call it, I'm here to do the work. I'm here to work on the leaders, work on the systems and processes to use. I'm here to help apostles. I'm here to help bishops. I'm here to help pastors, evangelists, prophets, and teachers. That's what we're called to do. So the body can be without spot, wrinkle, or any blemish. Do I have entrepreneur? Uh, that's a good question. Do I have entrepreneur ideas or all sorts of entrepreneur ideas? My podcast doesn't go anywhere. We might be slow right now, but we're not going anywhere. We continue to grow, continue to learn, continue to stretch, continue to try to help people find the principles of success. They're in the Bible. They're in people's lives. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Guess what? The blood of the Lamb's always there. The word of their testimony, we've got to find out how other people overcame so we can overcome ourselves. Do you want to really overcome? If so, reach out to me. This has been Chris Collier with Conquer Chris, the podcast you don't want to miss.